Thank you. It is 7.05 and it's my privilege to call the meeting of the Wellness Center Pool Committee to order. And Rebecca, if you would please take us through roll call. Certainly. Uh, please just say your name, unmute your microphone and say your name, uh, sorry, and just say yes in response to the roll call. Chair Donald Sanderson? Yes. Archipelago Reeve Burt Liverance? Yes. Carning Councillor Terry Gilbert? Can you unmute your microphone, please, Councillor Gilbert? Yes. Thank you. McDougall Mayor Dale Robinson? Yes. McKellar Councillor Morley Hascom? Yes. Perry Sound Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Seguin Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. And Whitestone Mayor George McComry? Chair George McComry, uh, sorry, uh, Mayor George McComry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, um, that's very, that's it. I'll turn it over to you, uh, Chair Sanderson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. So I understand that we have a quorum and a special welcome to our guests and observers who are joining us via video streaming. Fortunately, there's nothing more compelling and exciting than our evening being broadcast this evening. If uh, you would be so, uh, so kind um, as to indulge me, there's a few uh, pieces of housekeeping that I would like to share with our, with our viewers. All meetings of the Wellness and Center and Pool Committee are being live streamed and recorded. Uh, for the benefit of those gathered and the public watching this virtual meeting, we'll start, we have begun with a roll call and um, and we would just ask that people keep their um, cameras and their their microphones muted unless we are um, speaking. If you would uh, be so kind as to indulge me, I'd like to just share a very few thoughts as we begin this evening's deliberations. As I reviewed the comprehensive package of materials that were carefully prepared to support our decision making, it occurred to me that after 30 plus years and a number of perhaps dress rehearsals, we're closer than we've ever been to realizing what so many communities aspire to provide to their citizens, a wellness center and pool. While there are elements of excitement for the possibilities and perhaps some anxiousness with respect to the unknowns, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that this is our time, our opportunity to provide leadership, perhaps to make difficult decisions, and above all, to improve the health and wellness of the citizens that together we're privileged to serve. Our elected representatives and their respective leadership and support teams are to be commended for their unwavering energy, support, and commitment that have brought us this far. I do sincerely believe that this is our time. So without further ado, I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes of the June 19th minute meeting of the Wellness Center and Pool Committee. May I have a mover, please? Mayor Robinson, and seconder. Mayor McCarvey, and the motion is that the minutes of the June 19th, 2020 Wellness Center and Pool Committee meeting are hereby approved as circulated. Any discussion? Any errors, omissions? Are you ready for the question? All in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried, thank you. The next item on our agenda is the uh, approval of the agenda. I ask for a mover and a seconder for the agenda as circulated. Uh, Reeve Liverance and Mayor Comrie. At the agenda for October 22nd Wellness uh, Center and Pool Committee meeting is hereby approved as circulated. All in favor? Opposed, if any. Thank you, that too is carried. Moving on, uh, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Hearing none, we're ready to move on to item two, which is new business. And that would be the West Perry Sound Area Recreation and Culture Center. Tonight we have before us reports and recommendations on a variety of 
aspects relating to the project. I would now call upon uh, the steering committee to please walk us through this report. Mr. Harris, if you would please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, first, on behalf of the steering committee, kind of, I, I'd like to echo your comments about the significance and importance of this evening's agenda. It's the culmination of a lot of people's effort over 20 and 30 years, and uh, I don't think we've ever been this close. So pretty significant uh, meeting this evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm here uh, this evening speaking on behalf of the steering committee, not as a representative of the town of Perry Sound. For the benefit of the public, uh, the steering committee is comprised of the CAOs from the seven West Perry Sound area municipalities. Throughout the process, the information material has been shared with our counterparts at Wasoxing and First Nation communities, uh, Shawnigan and First Nation communities as well. Uh, the steering committee didn't work alone. We've had the benefit of professional advice from CSNP Architects, Tatham Engineering, and Barston Law. We've also received recommendations developed by the Citizens Advisory Committee. So at this point, I just, I'd like to thank everyone for their work in bringing this report and these recommendations forward this evening. It's, it's been a challenge. It's taken a, a tremendous amount of time and effort to come to a common understanding and bring this report and recommendations to you this evening. Throughout the process, all the steering committee had, uh, all steering committee members have had the opportunity to provide input into reports and the recommendations. As a steering committee, our diverse backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives generated a lot of discussion. I'm sure you can appreciate that. In the end, these differences have resulted in a more thoughtful recommendation. Uh, it would have been too easy, and perhaps the recommendations wouldn't stand up as well if we were all started out on the same page. So I think uh, we all benefited from a lot of discussion and uh, disagreement along the way. For the benefit of the public, I'd like to take a moment to review the process and where we are in that process. Uh, the process started back uh, just over a year ago, September 2019. The area municipalities approved a decision-making model, which included the creation of a citizens advisory committee and a steering committee that reports to the wellness and uh, pool committee, which is the committee that's meeting this evening. The mandate of the wellness center and pool committee is to gather information, undertake studies, and conduct other analysis so the committee can make a recommendation to the participating councils whether or not to proceed with the construction of a wellness center and pool and how the project should move forward. So the purpose of this evening's uh, meeting is to discuss the results of the due diligence work and determine what recommendation or recommendations will be presented to the respective councils as we move forward. Uh, that, that's the opening comments I have, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Harris. So I would propose that we'd look at each of the six sec sections in turn. And if there are questions specific to that section, we might wait to hear from our various presenters first. However, there, if there are any questions or comments generally that members would like to make um, at this point, now would be the time to do so. Mr. Harris, you could provide some information for us on uh, Section 1, the facility programming and amenities. Uh, certainly. Um, the facility programming and amenities, uh, that was developed with uh, direct input from the Citizen Advisory Committee. This topic, along with Topic 2, a site selection, are woven into the report that uh, and presentation that was attached to your agenda from... Uh, CSMP architects. So the way the presentation is presented, I think we'll be talking about uh, the site and, and the programming as one. Uh, so with us this evening, we have Sam Spagnolo from uh, CSMP architects, Susan Lewin from CSMP architects, and Bill Van Ryan from Tatham Engineering. So uh, at this point, I think I'd turn it over to, uh, to Sam and he can walk us through the presentation. And if Forrest, if you could bring up the presentation. Um, sorry, can I uh, share my screen? With, I, if we've updated our presentation a bit, uh, so I'd like to share my screen and, and do the presentation if that's all right. You can do that now, I have just turned it on. All right, thank you again, Chair and the committee. We're happy to be here presenting our findings over the last, uh, nine months 
uh, plus or minus. Uh, it's been a very interesting process. And what I'm going to do is share our presentation uh, that you have. It's just a little bit modified uh, because we had some updates and stuff that we put into the presentation. So. So as we go through, um, we were initially uh, engaged to look at five sites. Um, and then once we visited uh, the five sites, we, we uh, as a committee with the steering committee, uh, reduced it down to three sites. The first site, uh, the Y site, uh, 36 Smith Crescent. Uh, the second site is the municipally owned site on Perry Sound Drive. And the site four, which was the St. Joseph Street uh, site, um, we looked at each of them and, and uh, thought that these would be the viable sites that we can fit the program and the, uh, the, the building and growth. Uh, site selection, uh, we had Bill Van Ryan from Tatum, uh, who we've had uh, many uh, worked with for oh, many years. Uh, we worked together, Bill and I, on uh, Gravenhurst Community Center and the Bracebridge High School Community Center. Um, so Bill was key on our team to because we he knew the the, the municipalities and their uh, requirements and the, and the infrastructure. So he did initial costing uh, study, which was an in-depth study um, looking at each of the sites and broke it down costs for individual uh, items like general external servicing, bringing services from the end of the, the line to the, the site uh, the road work, the internal services from the street into the, into the property, um, the site work on the property. Uh, some sites required a lot of clearing, uh, some blasting, some uh, access points. Uh, then there were prov the provisional work. And then uh, because it was a, a study and not detailed engineering, we allowed for a 25% contingency, which is normal in this state, uh, this type of study. And 10% for engineering, which again, uh, for additional engineering studies that were outside the scope. So when we were selected, there were a criteria in the RFP that uh, what we, how we looked at each of the, the three sites that we uh, considered and the weight weighing of it was part of the RFP and that's how we looked at each site. Um, the first one was location and accessibility to the public and optimized uh, marketing opportunity access to major transportation routes, traffic consideration and close to schools. Um, so close to schools wasn't initially in the uh, criteria, but was added at, uh, through our discussions with the steering committee. So property one, which is the Weiss uh, property, um, it's on a major transportation route north of the town, close to the fitness trail on the west side of Perry Sound leading to the high school. Uh, property two, which is the municipal site on Perry Sound Drive, also on a major transportation route north of the town, presently has no sidewalks and the hide, it's uh, a busy street. Uh, we've been on that street many times and there are a lot of trucks and vehicles going uh, on that street. Um, it, it is planned to have a, a bike trail in the future, uh, but it's not there right now and it would need some road engineering to do that. Um, Property four is the St. Joseph site. It's also uh, on a main street on the north side of town, closest to the downtown, closest to the fitness trail on the west side of Perry Sound and 
right next to the high school. Um, so we weighed it. So the, we thought for location and accessibility, property four, which is the St. Joseph was the most uh, accessible. Property two was 18% and property one, which is the wide 19%. So they were all good locations and they were, we all felt they were in that category at the top of their, uh, at the site uh, location. The score for site acquisition uh, and cost for preparing kind of site preparation. So uh, the Y site, there was uh, discussions with the Y as uh, being turned over because it was donated from the from the, uh, the municipality to the Y that they would either go into a long term care uh, lease or there would be an agreement for a nominal fee to turn the land over to the municipality. Uh, the municipal site is owned by West Perry Sound, Perry Sound and uh, Carling. Um, it's assumed, we, we're assuming five acres for the development. That's what we need for the, the wellness center, including the parking and all the site development. It's only 10% of the land is being used. It's a 50 acre site. So we, we prorated the $440,000 that was paid for the land and we prorated. So the cost for that land would be 44,000. The St. Joseph's site uh, was unknown and was estimated at $2.4 million through our discussions with searching on, on property values in that area. Um, so that one was very expensive. The site preparation, these costs come from Tatum's uh, uh, breakdown in the previous slide. It's all the internal servicing and internal site work that these numbers come from. So for the Y site, it was uh, calculated to be 950,000. Uh, and for property two, uh, it was 5,500,000. And for property uh, four, it was $2.8 million. Uh, so uh, based on those numbers and assuming that the lowest uh, amount of site preparation got the highest score and it worked, um, the next ones, the municipal site was 15% and the St. Joe's site was 12% we assigned to it. Um, item number three, the accessibility and cost to provide utilities to the the site and uh, sewers, water, hydro, natural gas, high-speed fiber. The order of magnitude is the purpose to evaluate the property. So this is all the, the services from where they end on the streets, bringing them to the property line of the site. Property one, um, it is $4 million based on Tatum's uh, estimates. Um, what is already there is the, hyd the hydro line. It runs along Smith Crescent. Uh, the, there's a natural gas line there. Water's already on site. Um, it was the cost to bring the sewers up and, and to the site and the storm. Uh, property two, the municipal site was $4.7 million. Uh, again, bringing all the services to the property line. Uh, property four was $3.9 million. So prorated based on the amount, uh, this was 25%. The St. Joseph's site uh, got 25%. The municipal site got 21%. And the Y got 24%. Then uh, the fourth item uh, criteria was size, flexibility of the parcel, ability to have additional related future uses around the adjacent site. And based on the acreage. So the, the Y site is 15.9 acres. There are nine acres available that the town of Perry Sound that abuts it. Now, 50% of that is, uh, could not have a building on it. 
but can be used for exist uh, like parking or fields uh, because of the low, the, the swampy uh, land. And the, the other uh, I, item that we noticed about the site and noted about it was that there is planned development on the west side of the site on the other side of the street. There's, it's easy development, it's, um, it's uh, visible, it's uh, ready to go. So if the sewers do come up to the Y site, it will spur development and spur uh, growth in that area. Um, when we looked at the municipal site, it's 53.2 acres. 80% of that land is undeveloped because of the slope, the actual slope of the lands by the water. And uh, it could be developed, you'd have to blast quite a bit of rock to make it developable, but the, the slopes are greater than uh, 45 degrees. And we'll show a map showing the, the amounts uh, of the slope. Um, and then the last site, which is the St. Joseph site, is 4.8 uh, acres. And there was no room for expansion on that site. So we prorated it um, on the 20%. Uh, the Y got 19%. The municipal site got 20%. And the St. Joseph's got 5%. The final, sorry, the, oops. The final criteria was the uh, environmental assessment. Um, we only did an environmental uh, assessment because uh, when we went for the application for the grant um, for the Y site, which was determined by the, this committee to use as the site for the grant municipal, uh, the federal and provincial grant, we did, we did a ESA report on this site, uh, the Y site only. So we did not score any of the sites with the ESA. So based on the criteria, the Y site scored 82%, the municipal site scored 74%, and the St. Joseph site scored 62%. So part of the, the uh, the analysis of the site was to look at the two highest scoring sites and see what what avail what are the assets of the sites and what are the challenges of the sites. So when you look at this photo of the Y, you can see that it, everything's flat and visible. The Y has a presence on the site. It's known that this is a uh, where the Y is. It's been there for many years. Um, it will spur development because of the visibility, because of the access to the site. Um, and uh, it also has the, the uh, fitness trail that leads out to McDougal and the big diamonds by the highway out that way. Uh, the sports field. The municipal site, uh, as you can see from this site on per this site, uh, picture of Perry Sound, is has a lot of rock. It's elevated from the street quite a bit. For us, where our siting of the 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 facility is at the plateau, uh, that's to minimize the amount of blasting that we're going to need to do. We're going to still have to blast to get the rock, uh, the, the road up from the road, from the Perry Sound Drive up to the plateau site. And I believe it's 12 to 13% slope on that driveway. So we'd have to deal with some uh, access for accessible people uh, having disabilities and, and accessibility issues to get up to the site. So there'd have to be a, some additional walkways that create uh, up to the, the plateau. Um, so uh, Susan's gonna talk about the uh, program and the two options now. 
So I'll turn it over to Susan okay. Lee from our office. Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, so we thought we'd just start with the original plan that we did quite a while ago, back in November 2019. And just so for context, this is the plan that was submitted to for the uh, federal grant application. So it shows one single gym, uh, fitness with an interior walking track, fitness studio, four lane pool, change rooms, three medium multi-purpose rooms, two small multi-purpose rooms and one large divisible. And we're not showing you here, there's a small basement or filtration room uh, where they go down the stairs to the right. So the total area, which is up at the upper left is the ground floor 44, seven, the lower floor 38 and the total floor areas 48, five or 49, let's say roughly. So that was the original scheme. And then the um, community advisory committee reviewed it. So uh, we got some recommendations from them, uh, 10 recommendations uh, a couple of months ago. And their group had decided that um, they would like to recommend a six lane pool, not a four lane pool, um, primarily for the purpose of swim meets and, and other more flexible swim programming. Uh, a larger leisure therapy pool with play area amenities and a kind of separate relaxation area, but all in one tank, not another tank. So it'd still be two tanks. They wanted a sauna off the pool deck. They recommended a larger gym that was sized for competition, not the single gym that we were showing, but a double gym that could accommodate four pickleball courts and a curtain to divide it into two. Uh, for competition size. They also recommended a walking track. Uh, they did recommend that the walking track be on the upper level, looking down over some program. They wanted uh, to incorporate uh, on the ground floor, preferably a common area with vending machines or some kind of cafe area where people could meet and socialize. Um, the seventh recommendation was that there be an upstairs, a second level for swim meets and gymnasium competitions. Um, so an upper level where you can look down on the pool and look down on the gym with a fairly large capacity of occupants for when there's tournaments or competitions. Uh, they didn't recommend any change to the fitness and studio. Uh, the multi-purpose rooms, they were also happy with the amount we had shown, which is two small, three medium, and one large. There were other uh, recommendations, such as a splash pad, tennis courts, energy efficiency, charging stations, and recognition of Indigenous culture and local history. Uh, we do feel that um, we do have superior energy efficiency uh, measures in the budget presently. Um, we do have recognition of Indigenous culture on the radar, and that's not necessarily um, a cost item at this point. And then the other things would need to be discussed because we have not included a splash pad or an outdoor tennis court. But those are things we can review later, I think. Uh, next slide, please. So we did two options, and the way we approached it is we said, okay, option A is going to incorporate as many recommendations as possible within the original area, which was, let's say 49,000 square feet. In other words, there's an attempt for option A to keep it with the same budget that was submitted for the federal grant and the same area, but try to interleave as many important measures as possible. So we um, started with the, uh, the single gym remains the same. Uh, the fitness walking track, we did um, recommend that we could make it longer and have it go around the studio. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of what that would look like to satisfy um, the walking track idea without having to build a second level, which is obviously gonna be quite costly. Um, in this scheme, it's still a four lane pool uh, still a, a good sized therapy pool. 
Um, there is there are ways to make a four lane pool accessible for swim meets and have a space for future starting blocks and shape the bottom of the tank so that it can accommodate diving. But that would be a local swim meet. It wouldn't be, you know, a big regional swim meet because, of course, Bracebridge has eight lanes and is, you know, fairly nearby. Um, the next option we show you will have the six lanes. And then in order to accommodate the meeting space cafe idea, which is a really nice idea, um, we did remove a, 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 a few meeting rooms. So in this scheme, you have two small meeting rooms, one medium and one large that's divisible. So you have less meeting rooms to get the social space. Now in this scheme, we can massage the size of the social space and the meeting rooms, but in general, you're going to have a bit less meeting rooms. Um, I think, uh, so what we were able to fit also is the sauna on the pool deck. So um, at the end of the day, we were able to fit the meeting space, the sauna on the pool deck, uh, almost a hundred meter walking track, which is the size of race bridge is about 110 meters and this is 95 meters. So it's a pretty long walking track. Um, so we think we got a lot of, um, a lot of requests in there. Now keep in mind in terms of pool viewing and gym viewing, we do have a uh, robust viewing on the ground level. So um, there are benches by the gym and people can look in on the gym. Um, and there's also a viewing area just beside the therapy pool that is within the pool envelope that parents can sit and watch their children and, and you can view from there. Of course, it's not tournament uh, quantities, but it is a uh, good viewing opportunities. Okay, next slide, please. So this is just to give you an example of what a walking track that's going around a cardio area and around a studio. The picture on the right is going around a, you know, a yoga fitness studio all the way around what it would look like. And you'd have signs saying which direction you walk in on which days and, and that kind of thing. Okay, next slide, please. So just to summarize, uh, the, the option A had the four lane, still has a leisure pool, sauna included. The gym is the, still the smaller size, but it can have three pickleball courts. And a pickleball court is the same size almost as a, a badminton court. So you basically have three badminton slash pickleball. It's the same court. Um, and I just want to mention something that after we received the CAC recommendations, it was determined that um, a regulation gymnasium is going to be built, uh, built in the new high school and that that might be adequate to accommodate the large competition regulation size gym that they were requesting. So that it, it's in, in the end of the day, we determined uh, consensually that we don't think uh, the larger gym is actually required because of the new high school that's planned. And the RFP has gone out and the whole process has started for that high school. Um, and so you have a almost a hundred meter, you know, roughly a hundred meter walking track. You have a common area and you have viewing areas at the ground floor. Now keep in mind the upper level was also requested to have gym viewing, but because there's not a competition gym anymore, the upper level gym viewing is not required. So that's a bit of a change to the request. Um, the fitness area is still the same size, just kind of reorganized to have the walking go around the studio just to get a longer walking experience. And then of course you have less multi-purpose rooms two small, one medium, and one large divisible room. Okay, let's go to the next uh, option, which is option B. So option B was our effort to get as much as possible from the CAC recommendations into the uh, scheme. And this option is 59,000 square feet, so it is bigger. What we did is we added the six lane pool and the larger divided, it's not literally divided, but it's kind of a zoned therapy pool with the play areas, with the sprayers and the relaxation area separated. So we added the bigger pool, but in order to 
save a uh, footprint on the ground floor, we rotated the single gym sideways so that we try to keep the length of the building more or less the same from the top to the bottom. Now, because we rotated the gym and we have an upper level track, so the gym is a bit bigger uh, because you can't have an upper level track overhang any of the game lines. Uh, the fitness area is the same size, but we took away the studio and put it into the purple area, which is the multi-purpose rooms. And that's a common theme that happens in YMCA's where the fitness studio, because it's always very, um, it has an instructor and they know who's, you know, in the class, they don't need to, you don't need to pass through control in order to get to the fitness studio. So this is very doable. So in other words, part of the fitness is out in the, in the main area. We hived it off in order to keep the floor plan small. So in this scheme, you still have the sauna on the pool deck. You still have the viewing at the ground floor. Uh, you do have less multi-purpose rooms on this floor because of the meeting space. But we also had to add a number of stairs for exiting. So you can see now there's three stairs and there's also an elevator to go up to the second floor. So let's go up to the second floor now, Sam. So now you see there's a second floor. So here you have a pool viewing area that is part of the pool environment. So when you walk in, you're in, you know, the chlorinated environment and you can hear and see everything. And there's quite a bit of seating up there. Um, in general, I think the concept is that the pool viewing areas would not typically be open. They would only be open when there's a swim meet. So it may be that this area is not open very often, depending. Um, we also were able to fit some more multi-purpose rooms upstairs uh, because we, you know, had less multi-purpose rooms downstairs. And we have, uh, again, about a 90 or 100 meter walking track, this time around the gym. So um, what you have here, though, you need to have a controlled corridor to that walking track from the access point. So um, I just want to explain how you would get to the walking track if you were a Y member. Can you go back to the ground floor, uh, Sam, for a second? So there's a controlled corridor north of the change rooms that you, once you go into the building, it's all public in the purple area, but then you go through control and you show that you're a member. And then you would walk to the end and go up the stairs to go to the walking track. So that's all controlled, that's members only. The walking track though can be available to the public and they do do that at Innisfil Y where there's times of day where the public pay money, they give cash at the desk and they go in and they use the walking track. They pay $2 or something to use the walking track at certain times of day. Um, so go back to the second floor now. So you could see the orange area here is the controlled corridor for members. That doesn't mean that you can't just open up the walking track at times. Obviously, all of how this is going to work needs to be, you know, sorted out. But in general, you have a public area and then you have the controlled, the YMC controlled area for members. Um, so, so I guess you get the idea. Now, what might happen to the second floor is it may be closed at times, it might be opened at times, it may be that the walking track is only open. So there's a lot of um, things that would need to be sorted out with access security on the second floor. Um, so let's keep going. So just to summarize, what option B gets is the six lane pool, the larger therapy pool, the sauna off the pool deck, the same gym size, except it is a bit bigger because when you have a walking track around a gym, you need to make the gym a bit bigger. Then you have the walking track upstairs. Uh, you have the common area with the vending machines. Um, you have viewing area upstairs, but not to the gym area, just to the pool because it was determined we don't need the competition gym viewing. Uh, the fitness studio is still a good size. Uh, it's just divided now. And the multi-purpose rooms, you have two small, one large, and the fitness studio, which is a flexible room. It could be a multi-purpose room and a fitness studio. And then you have two more mid-size rooms on the second floor also available. Now, I don't know if you guys want to ask questions now, but 
or I should keep going. I'm just going to show you some costing, I guess. Let me know if you want to interrupt at all um, and ask questions. But just in, in terms of a summary, this is a high level costing. Uh, we've, we, uh, we kind of came to the conclusion that option B, which is, you know, 10,000, 10 or 11,000 square feet more is going to cost an additional roughly 8.7 million. Part of that cost is when you add two pool tanks and a larger therapy pool, you do add kind of a disproportionate um, impact to the capital cost because of the, you know, the very expensive pool um, construction cost um, and also operating cost. Uh, I just want to reiterate that option A is the same cost as we submitted to the federal application and option B is, is larger. Yes, now let's, sorry. Sorry, I didn't update the overall costs for option A in the title block. If you look at the bottom, if the option A is 31.2, uh, 250 million, and the option B is just under 40 million. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was reading that and I thought that's a bit yeah. low, but um, yeah, sorry, that, my error. Basically, it's a tiny bit low, but in general, you can see. These budget costs are all in costs. They include all soft costs. So that means that includes furniture and um, all costs, you know, all fees. It's not just construction costs. So the total project cost is 31,250 for option A and 39,997 for option B. Um, let's go to the um, last slide. Um, then we also have. Um, operating costs that we need to think about because of course you have the capital cost which is just to build the building uh, then you have ongoing costs so these are numbers that um, kind of summarize what we <clears throat> what is estimated as being annual operational costs so option a has a, a deficit of 295,000 in other words it's not necessarily covered by the revenue um, which is kind of driven by membership and, you know, our numbers may be conservative or they may be optimistic. Uh, we'll only know later. Um, option B uh, is 425,000 a year because there are more operational costs with having a larger building and having more staff required because of the larger building and more uh, chlorine, more heat to the pool, more mechanical, more electrical. Um, I, if you have questions about any of these numbers, uh, please feel free. I think this is the last slide. Yeah, this is the last slide. And we worked with uh, Ryan Purdy from the Y on these operating costs. So these are based on uh, similar sized uh, YMCAs uh, for each option. I, this, this is the last slide. Yeah, so let's open it up for questions comments for presenters can i ask a question sure um just a question um i've i've reviewed the community uh consultation document where there was a really hard push for six lanes not necessarily for competitive meets, but for flexibility in types of programming. And I'd be interested in knowing what it would cost to kind of create a hybrid of option A, but make it a six lane pool. So I, I looked at that um, and roughly it's about $800,000 because you'd have to be increasing the, the uh, pool volume um, by two lanes. So I took just so it was a high level cost. I took the, the cost per square foot uh, of option A and multiplied it by that area and volume. And it ended up being about just around $800,000. Now we'd have to confirm that, but that's a good guesstimate. And what would happen to operating costs? 
well, they would go up as well because it's a bigger tank, more chlorine, um, more volume. The, the dehumidification of that space would be a bigger mechanical uh, a piece of equipment. So that would go up as well, proportionally. There's also cleaning costs for the pool. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of little costs involved with pools, like mm -hmm. a lot of costs. No, I uh, Ryan Purdy, you may want to speak to that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, typically uh, the increase in utilities is, is usually associated with the increase in the pools. They tend to draw uh, with the water that we have to move through the pool every day, the increase in the chemicals, the increase in the space and, and the lighting that goes with it, the, the pool is usually a, a large expense on the utilities uh, in a facility. How it breaks out, I'm not 100% sure how the breakout work in a building, but it, it tends to draw the most utility usage uh, in the facility. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, did you want to comment on the idea of the four lane pool versus the six lane in terms of program flexibility? Yeah, certainly with a six lane pool, there is more options for usage. You know, we're, we're adding more lane swims. We have the ability to run more swimming lessons, larger aquafit programming. The larger the pool, certainly the more programming and the higher capacity we would have in that space. Um, the question would be whether that space would be utilized based upon the members that uh, come into the facility. Um, speaking for Gravenhurst, where we average between 1,900 and, and say 2,100 members, a four-lane pool is what we have there, which is the, the lap pool. Um, and typically, space is not an issue. We're able to accommodate all the user groups with the swim team and lane swims and swimming lessons and aquafits. Um, and in Innisfil, we have a six-lane pool that, that we operate. Um, but again, we're closer to a 6,000 membership based center there. Um, so the need for that larger size pool um, is warranted sort of in a community of that size. So it really depends on sort of where we're projecting membership to be. Heard the um, Councillor Gilbert. Am I okay, you can hear me? Um, I just had a question with the operating cost. Um, I'm under the understanding that when you go to six lanes, you need another lifeguard, same as if you add a diving board, add certain things. Can we do five lanes and still stay within the one lifeguard for operating cost? And then, you know, within that scope of a building, or do we need to add square footage and, and things? So the way that it is uh, worded today, it is one guard per tank is a recommendation for, for lifeguards. So whether it's a four lane or six lane tank, it's still one, one lifeguard for that pool. And then the leisure pool would have a separate lifeguard that would guard that. And then the guards, the lifeguards would increase as the number of participants that are in the pool, which is the same whether you have four or six. So whether you have a four lane, five lane or six lane is still one guard per tank and the number of lifeguards increases as the number of bathers enter the pool. Thank you. And just just another question on the uh, the pricing when you were talking about the uh, the dollar numbers there. I know talking to um, just residential builders, not commercial builders around here, the cost of material has gone like skyrocketed. Uh, is your pricing on today's uh, COVID pricing, I guess you would call it. Are you talking about operational costs or capital? No, constru no, I think sorry, he's talking building. construction costs. And construction costs, yes. So um, we did the costing at uh, uh, pre-COVID, um, but the interesting thing that we've seen in recent tenders is that uh, contractors are hungry. So prices are actually competitive even though materials are have gone up prices have maintained the, the same level because of um, the a lack of work out there right now so 
So yeah, because this is not the residential market. This yeah. is the institutional. I know the residential market is going yes. crazy right now. There's no more, you know, deck material and So you're saying that institutional uh, contractors are now sort of outbidding uh, each other, trying to get in? Are, are, are much more competitive right now. So, and that's what we've had on a number of tenders that we've closed on other institutional jobs that they're, they, even though materials are higher, the competitiveness has made them uh, almost at the same level pre COVID. Can we have can we have uh, questions about the uh, the sites or do you want to stick with the pool part here? So I'm gonna leave I that to the chair. You should ask whatever question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were saying about the um, I'm gonna go with the benefits sort of thing of the two properties. So the the 50 acres, uh, in my opinion, I guess, and if hope, hopefully I'm not alone in this. But the sort of the benefits to the town of, Bear, of Perry Sound is that Beatty Street would gain water and sewer going across, which would add um, some residential housing in there, which would give a, a tax base to the town of Perry Sound and the, the property to the north, I guess, um, that goes from Beatty Street to Church Street could tap into that and possible development that's a little bit more costly in there because of the rock and things to go in there as well um, in comparison to and for me the 50 acres has the two schools there so it's close uh, in comparison to what development at the y property would be available if the water or the water's there if the sewer goes up so i can talk about the development on the west side is all that land um, uh, on the west side of uh, perry sound drive on that side is all developable and once that once you bring the sewer up there could be commercial there could be, it's all zone it could be zoned up for residential it's a lot less blasting a lot easier to develop as you go down there and the visibility again so, so that's for so a tax want... basis you could develop uh condos there you could develop uh commercial you can develop all kinds of stuff all the way up to the 400 at that level. Cause and why don't you show the, the site slide again? Just okay, so let people me, can remember. Yeah, let me go back. Um, so just the um, part of that that's a little scary is the, the west side where LNH is about to develop mm -hmm. or Bourgeois, I guess. Um, they're coming anyways. I don't think I've talked to him. He doesn't care about water and sewer. He's going to put a septic in because he doesn't know, need that much. But um, so you've got that piece and one more. Um, this this goes all the way to the railway. That land goes all the way to the railway and it just moves all the way where those there's an auto body shop and further down the road. And, yeah, so they're developed already. That's why yeah. I'm asking like what what possible, you know, well, what, they, for, what what benefit to the town, I guess, I'm trying to get the two properties and benefit yes. to the town, because I know that like the railroad is there and you won't get a crossing there no, to do no. uh, a residential or any kind of development. The, the well, there's, there's also the other side of Smith uh, Crescent that could be developed on that side as well. But this has whole, uh, a whole area that will develop could be residential, could be commercial, could be all kinds of availability. If the sewers come, they will build, right? And those auto shops and and that development will probably redevelop and build a bigger tax base uh, thing. Personally, I, from looking at this, this is a much uh, easier site to to see off spin from the development than the municipal site because of the visibility. Uh, you may bring sewers through Beatty Road, but that facility is gonna be 20, 30 feet up in the air in, uh, on the top of the rock that is 
when we walked the site, you couldn't see the street from where we were going to put the, the site without blasting a huge amount of rock to get it visible. You would see the site from, there may be some visibility from the 400, but it wouldn't have any street presence. Like uh, Bill had said, when we walked the site, it's a 12 to 13% slope up to the site. So sorry, I don't want to be the, the guy going back and forth here. No, 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 but no. The, so the, the Y property, mm -hmm. um, where it is, mm -hmm. um, if, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if that development is possible there, it looks like LNH or Bourgeois is going there anyways. Um, you're saying about the auto parts being there, uh, Viceroy's up there. Um, the nine acres that is beyond the Y is, is fairly swampy, so I'm not sure you know what can go there. Fifty percent, fifty percent can be developed uh, of okay. that site, and so the that, other fifty percent could be parking lot or accessory uses to that uh, site. So, okay. So if 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 the I guess what I'm trying to say is if the development goes to the fifty acres, and then down the road it becomes you know where the arena might go or that kind of thing. Won't that area, um, when Bourgeois Motors goes there and all those different things are there, won't that area develop anyways? And won't it be a, a commercial residential assessment base for the town? And the other spot will become probably not. It'll be yeah. nothing. So if, we, if, we, if it's built on the Y, won't the other spot become nothing? Well, no, but that site could be developed uh, for smaller footprint developments like a condo or residential uh, because then you have less blasting less cost to bring that those services in to that that site it has potential i just don't believe uh, and this is my personal uh opinion it doesn't have the same potential that the y has because there's a presence it's already there the y is a known entity there and it will draw the, the development up here that hasn't happened in the last 30 years. Okay, and then just the, just the la last point, sorry, like I said, I don't mean to be that guy, but yeah. the, the, the 50 acres, when I think about the town of Perry Sound, I've been here 40 years, mm -hmm. and the difference of like, if the Y went there, and then I, I did talk to the mayor about this before, about if they, the arena needed to move in 10 years sort of thing, things start to be in the same spot. No, or if I, we go to the, I we go to the Y, aren't we sort of caught with the, the Y being there and then there is not a lot of room to add those other things? Well, you can, add, you can add the, the arena to the nine acres, uh, the other site, part, the other site that the town owns, or it could be designed as a campus Right now, that wasn't our uh, uh, job to look at as a campus. Uh, but again, Arena has a large footprint that would require a, a lot of blasting. So when, and typically uh, our experience in Arena, one right Arena doesn't pay for itself, but when you put two Arenas or a four pad Arena complex, it starts to generate the, the income that's required to maintain an arena. So it, this may be a two pad arena complex, which still needs a big footprint. And once you look at that, then you, you'll see the, the issues on the, the servicing those type of sites and, and going through that. No, I just I'm just trying to make sure that we don't miss something if we have a chance I, to say some 100%. other building could go beside or whatever. One hundred percent. And there was this talk that the school may go there, and now we know that the school is going in the exact same location that it's at. Um, we've been involved in a number of complex. Bracebridge is a perfect example where the high school and the municipality joined forces and uh, built one complex with the community theater involved. Uh, so it there when we first saw this uh, were given the sites 
our tendency was go to the 53 acre site as well. But once you actually walk that site and, and do further investigations, you see the challenges on that site. Now, um, Sam, uh, I think you mentioned earlier that you'd have a 13% slope up to the facility, which correct. is not so very me, free accessible. No, yeah. So, so nobody would be able to, in a wheelchair, would be able to go up that hill. It would be a very steep hill. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Bill wants to make some Thanks. comments too. Yeah. Bill Van Ryan, do you want to? I would if I could, please. Sorry to interrupt there, but thank you for the opportunity. The 12 to 13 percent is actually it's 13, 12 to 13 meters from the elevation of Perry Sound Drive up to the parking lot. So you're looking at about 40 feet of vertical from Perry Sound Drive up to the parking lot, and then the building would rise up from the parking lot. So to Sam's point uh, of maybe 10, 15 minutes ago, the street presence of the building from Perry Sound Drive, they're completely disconnected. You would not be able to see the building aside from looking up the tunnel of the driveway essentially to see that the parking lot is up there. That uh, driveway would be at around 10 or 12 percent, which meets the building code requirements to get a fire truck in and out. To achieve that grade, there would have to be some blasting. And then if you just think about where the building is shown on that schematic, there's about four meters, almost five meters of vertical from the high corner of the building block to the low corner. That doesn't include the level areas around the building for sidewalks, walkways, fire route, that type of thing. So you end up having 20 plus feet, six plus meters of vertical from one side of the building to the other, which is an incredible amount of blasting to have to do. And um, the other thing in terms of future development on this property, we are really with the five acre uh, footprint that we're looking at, we are essentially taking half of the available reasonably level footprint on the property about um, two thirds plus of the property is at a slope 10% uh, or more, um, which is quite significant when you're thinking about a huge level pad. And um, that's, that's very hard to visualize when the drawings are at this scale. But when you stand out there and you pace from one end of the building to the other, and you're looking halfway up the trees on the other side, really puts it into perspective just how steep the site is from one corner of the building to the other. It's quite significant. Yeah, it wouldn't meet AODA requirements for accessibility within the site or to get to the site. 5% slope is the maximum for wheelchair access. This is important a discussion. I don't mean to uh, to thwart it. We have uh, a number of other uh, recommendations or presentations to receive. Are people content to uh, to move to our to our next uh, discussion around cost sharing? Okay, I would ask uh, the selection committee sure. to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I mean, I do have some more questions about the uh, site, and, uh, and I'm sorry. I, if we're going <laughs> to, if we're going to run out of time, but we're going to have to get to them oh. at some point, I would su suggest to you. Um, Important. Yes. I'm. I'm just wondering about the Y site. If there was any um, geotechnical investigation of the site, any core samples drilled or anything like that, I'm concerned about the possibility that when you try to excavate for the for the pool, you discovered there's a whole lot of water in there um, flowing through there, that kind of thing. What's can can somebody yeah, Bill, address Bill that can concern on that. my part? Bill, Bill can talk to that. Thank you. So uh, there was a geotechnical investigation done, uh, which really extended from the end of the existing services on Perry Sound Drive to the north to the site, and then a number of boreholes on the site. The um, the groundwater conditions are better 
than you would think when you're looking at the site and seeing the wetland to the north. The soils that are there are a bit silty. Uh, there is some clay and there is some peat in a, in a pocket. And as it turns out where we're uh, looking to put the building and the pool, the, uh, the rock is actually relatively deep. So there's not a lot of blasting to do. And then that softer material, the silt and the clay and the peat would get dug out to get down to a firmer base. Uh, and then the parking lot would go where the rock is a bit shallower so that we're not having to, to blast the rock to remove it, to build the building. Because the, the building, if you can imagine the pool and the, um, the maintenance rooms down below are about 12, 14 feet below slab grade. So that takes quite an excavation to get down to that. So the, the fact that the rock is deeper there, it actually works to our advantage. Okay, so you don't have any concerns then about the, about the. No, not. You know, I was more concerned that you wouldn't find uh, that you'd go down through a lot of stuff and you wouldn't be finding rock and mm -hmm. at all. No, no uh, rock was found. I mean, just to again put that into a bit of perspective, the south side of the site, uh, where the ball diamond is now, there's probably a three and a half, four meter high rock cut there. That transitions towards the the swampy area on the north side of the Y site. So we're actually sitting in that transition zone. We found bottom in every one of the boreholes. So we're not concerned that we're not gonna find solid ground to build on. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I I did have one other question if I may, Mr. Chair, um, and that going back to the operating cost, um, I wondered uh, what what assumptions uh, were made in in determining the operating costs? What assumptions were made about membership, about how much usage there would be uh, of the facility? Paid paid usage, I mean, by by people either taking out memberships or pay, or paying for lessons and pay, paying to be on part of a swim team and so on. Um, I think Ryan could speak to that. Because he we did make some assumptions together with Ryan Purdy. Uh, thank you for for the scenarios that we uh, presented on the two different sizes. Um, we used a membership base of of two thousand members. We sort of that was the number we sort of selected to sort of build sort of a mock budget of what uh, it would look like in terms of revenue for that facility. Typically in a YMCA, we are membership driven revenue model. That's usually where we make the majority of our revenue. We certainly, there's an opportunity for, for day camps to generate revenue, rentals, which would be your swim teams, your other user groups uh, coming into the facility. Um, but the majority of that revenue is, is always, and will always be driven by, by membership and, and that usage model. So, so those figures that like the three hundred thousand that you had for option A, that that that's net after 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 the revenue, or is that that's not the entire operating cost? I'm assuming, right? No, that's that's the the loss based on the revenue. Yeah, that's well, the net revenue, cost after after revenue. Revenue yeah. minus expenses. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's that was my assumption. The questions with respect to siting and uh, amenities. Okay, may I ask a member of the selection committee to take through the cost sharing formula, please? Um, we're going to go off the call now, right? The consultant team? Uh, I think uh, if the consultants to do a site selection could could stay on uh, on the meeting, just maybe turn off your video. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In terms of the cost sharing formula, this formula isn't uh, new to the uh, 
new to the municipalities. This is the formula that was uh, extensive amount of work has been done over the last year. It was the formula that the uh, each of the area municipalities endorsed for cost sharing purposes. It's uh, there's different characteristics of each of our municipalities. Some of them have much higher assessment, have some have higher uh, populations, and so on and so on. So the formula that was adopted for the due diligence cost sharing um, is a, a modified approach. No one uh, households or population or assessment don't dominate. It's a, it's an averaging of those three measures. So it kind of blends out uh, the various measures that might weight towards or away from any one municipality. In addition, um, it, there's also a, uh, a driving distance fact factor that was worked in. Um, the YMCA said that uh, membership can be affected by the amount of distance between where the person lives and the facility. So there was a, a factor to discount uh, driving distance. And there was an additional um, uh, discount uh, in Seguin's case, it, the issue is the concern was raised that uh, residents in Seguin have options of going to Bracebridge, Huntsville, or Gravenhurst in terms of pools. Um, on page eight, um, just above where it says the cost allocation and the numbers, there is a, a typo in there that I wanted to point out for the to the members of the committee. The Paragraph starts uh, at the top of the page, the CIO's factor on, th on these differing, differing characteristics. And at the bottom of that paragraph in, par in, the, in brackets, it says, i.e. population, number of households and taxable assessment. That shouldn't, that's incorrect. It should say three driving distance categories, i.e. zero to 15 kilometers, 15 to 30 kilometers, and greater than 30 kilometers. Um, I mean, the formula is right. It's just the that paragraphs, uh, there's a typo. So uh, through the West Prairie Sound Geographic Network, staff are able to identify the number of households in each of those categories. So that's uh, you know, a pretty uh, accurate uh, number that falls into each of those distance categories. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I think we're certainly able to answer any questions that uh, members of the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Questions with respect to the proposed cost sharing formula? Steve Liverance, yes. Uh, so question for you, Clayton. Um, how did the uh, water access built in the driving distance formula? It would, if it's, Zero to it, it, the same as if it was. It's my understanding. It's the same as if it was road. It's just distance. If you're zero to fifteen kilometers from where the facility would be, um, then there's a discount. If you're fifteen to thirty kilometers away, because the GIS they use the GIS network to identify where the household is, and whether it's in Whitestone on uh, you know Wawa Cash Road or on an island, it's the distance is, is calculated. Thank you. I don't believe there was a, any difference if it was a, a driving distance or a boat ride. Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. I believe you're on mute, Councillor. Okay, back. Um, just on the cost sharing, um, two questions. Is everyone still in if the funding doesn't come through with the 73% and then all of a sudden we have a new number for the end result. Um, is everyone, has everyone thought about that for the fact of the, uh, the number of percentage they're in for? And then I wonder when we're trying to vote on the architect's presentation, um, I'm kind of not comfortable with voting on that until we know if we get the full grant or not. Because if we get full grant, maybe everybody's in for the six lane and if we don't, Maybe everybody's thinking four lane for the budgeting process. So just, is everyone in for the 70, this, if we don't get 73% funding, is everyone still on that same page of the funding formula? I would like to answer that question. 
perhaps uh, I could take a stab. I think if there's if we don't get the 73% funding, which is certainly what we uh, are hopeful of getting, all of this is going to change. You know, the, the numbers are bigger, and uh, we'd have to uh, you know look at a plan B and, and sort of recalibrate. If it's if it's 70% funding, that's one thing. If it's 60% or 50% or the, the application was turned down altogether. So it's pretty hard to guess what each municipality's reaction would be. But I think uh, without getting close to the 73% funding, we'd have to uh, recalibrate whether we want to continue with the project. So I mean, realistically. So just are we getting ahead of ourselves to um pass the recommendation or are we just saying like we should table that and recommend that that's i'm happy i mean with the numbers and everything on there obviously and, and my counselor happy um i just don't want to put somebody in a position where they've signed up for something and then we find out and then we say to point fingers at each other saying well you said you were in so i mean uh through the chair oh I mean, McGarvey. I was just going to say, like, uh, you know, we can modify the resolution to say that, you know, if we if we achieve the 73 percent, this is the uh, the, you know, the, the percentages. I, you know, if it's different, then we have to relook at it. But but as it stands, this is what we're supposed to get is 73 percent. Uh, that's what we signed up for. That's what the government's have so far committed to, um, which, you know, it's a pretty good dollar when you think of it, um, but we can remodify the resolution just basically to say, you know, if if it changes and it's less, then we have to take a relook because Mr. Harris is right. If if it is a change, there's going to be modifications to site plan. There's going to be modifications to everything uh, to make this work. So um, if if it's even achievable depending on the percentage, but this is what we're supposed to get, but it's better to air a resolution on the side of caution. Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Resolution not number nine says that pending approval of the ISIP grant application, the steering committee be directed to take necessary steps to create the joint municipal services board. So we're putting all of these pieces in place. Here's the governance model. Here's the cost sharing model. Here's what it'll look like. And, but the final piece of creating the board to manage all this won't be put in place if we don't get the, uh, uh, the grant application approved. Now you might put some caveats around the size of that grant application, you know, a 10% grant or 73% grant, but um, that was, we wanted to get all the, our ducks in a row with that last recommendation number nine pending approval of the grant. Because if I could just add, there's a lot of work to take whatever comes out of the working committee this evening to each municipality and get it approved. And uh, we don't want to be caught flat footed if we're fortunate enough to get the uh, provincial federal approval in the next little while. And, and we still don't have all these things at least passed through our council in a kind of a holding pattern, if you like. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Comrie. Yes, I, I, I guess, um, Mr. Chair, I guess my interpretation of um, of the the, the cost-sharing formula is it really it, it involves sort of two parts. The first part is, you know, what is a kind of a fair percentage based on on the size, the different sizes of the municipalities and the, dis, the the likely number of people that are going to come from a particular municipality to use this facility and so on. And um, I, I, I think there was, there has been previous discussion about this and, and uh, my assessment at least, uh, and, and I think most of uh, Whitestone Council would agree uh, that that's in our particular case, um, that's a, the number that we have, which is, I think, 6.1% is a reasonable number. 
a reasonable share as a percentage. Of course, the question a lot of people had was, well, you know, 6.1% of what? And, and, and if it's a huge number, then um, clearly the pro if the number gets large enough, clearly the project becomes unviable for us even at 6.1%. And I suspect that would apply to other municipalities, at least some of them. But um, so we still, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we have to have, I guess, some confidence that the, that the, uh, the projected operating cost deficit and, and the capital cost are, are, you know, are solid not for, for what we're going to do are solid numbers. But, um, uh, you know, so far, I don't, I don't see anything to cause us to go, uh, you know, cause, you know, cause us to, to panic or jump ship. So it's a case of, um, you know, if, if, um, if we don't, uh, clearly, if we don't, if, if we, if we can't get a significant amount of external funding such as we've applied for, then, you know, that, that is, uh, Clayton is right. That's going to be a problem. <laughs> but um, at this, at this point, I, I, would, I would say, let's be optimistic. Mayor, comments? All right, are we ready to uh, move on to discussion around the, the governance proposal? Mr. Harris? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, we had uh, professional advice from Barston Law they're a firm that has offices in uh, Barry, Bracebridge, Collingwood. And Mr. Scott McEachern is with us uh, this evening. He's from the Bracebridge office. He um, looked, uh, worked with the steering committee um, and he's gonna give us a, a, just a quick overview of a couple of things. One, did we wanna set up a joint under the legislation? Did we wanna set up a, a board? which is being recommended, or did we want to set up a corporation? And uh, he just quickly comment on that. And he also drafted a, uh, a partnership agreement that uh, we worked through on uh, two or three meetings with the steering committee, and uh, it's attached to your package. So I'll just turn it over to Mr. McEachern, and he'll give you a highlight of, of what's why we're going with the board versus a corporation and what the highlights in the partnership agreement are. Welcome, Mr. McEachern. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here with you tonight uh, on this exciting project. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been practicing law for a little over 18 years. Uh, 12 of those years were in-house counsel for a mid-size uh, municipality. So I, I have a little bit of perspective on the inside view and, uh, and hopefully uh, that can be a benefit. Um, as Mr. Harris indicated, one of the first things we looked at, or I was asked to look at, was the governance model. And under the Municipal Act, there, there are two basic choices. There's a Municipal Service Board or there's a Municipal Service Corporation. Um, the municipalities are authorized under the Act to, to establish a board uh, pretty much for any purpose, to manage any service or activity that they see fit in doing so. And of course, a group of municipalities are uh, authorized to set up a joint service board. A, a board is a, uh, a municipal service board is classified as a local board. And the importance of that is the board is bound by the same open meeting rules that municipal councils are. A municipal service corporation is not a local board and therefore not bound by the open meeting rules. And that's one of the key differences. And it's likely because of that key difference that the, uh, the regulations under the Act for Municipal Service Corporation require a business case study and public consultation should a municipality want to establish a corporation and basically justify it. And I suspect it's because of the, uh, there's no, there's considerably more privacy involved with a, with a corporation than a board. So some, when we looked at some of the business case studies done and the reasons for um, setting up a corporation, things came up uh, such as 
such as an arm's length, the need for an arm's length autonomy. Uh, a corporation is obviously a separate legal entity and um, it can operate outside of the political system. This can be helpful if you are um, setting up a corporation such as uh, land development. Some cities like Toronto and Ottawa ha now have land development corporations whose purpose is to make money rather than just sell the surplus property as is. They look at it, how can we add value and, uh, and make some money for the city, the ultimate shareholder of the corporation. You can imagine with the for-profit perspective um, and, and when they look at doing things, adding value to it, such as a rezoning or a demolition or building, um, that doesn't always jive with, with uh, other staff, such as the planning department. Their, their perspective is what makes good planning. So there's an inherent conflict there. So that's an example of where it makes sense to have a corporation, a separate legal entity, get them out of the building and, and have them work separately. And it keeps the, uh, the interests um, clear, clearly defined a little better. And that's not the case here. None of these, I'm gonna give you a few reasons. None of these reasons I think, uh, you know, apply to this situation, which is why I'm, I'm making the recommendation that you go with a board over a corporation. Uh, another uh, reason that a municipality may consider a corporation is uh, the expertise level required. Uh, again, so the electricity sector would be a, an example of that. Uh, again, you want that arm's length autonomy away from the political side of things. You typically on a corporation board of that nature are gonna have sector experts on there as opposed to a board which most often has uh, members of council. There was an example of uh, of a municipal uh, municipality looking at their electricity uh, operations and wanting to expand and they had a need to take on uh, significant debt. Um, as you may be aware, each municipality is limited into how much funds it can borrow. Um, but if you go, if you establish a corporation, the debt that the corporation takes on does not sit on the debt, uh, on the books of the municipality. So, if, if a municipality was close to its debt limit or, or undertaking a very large project like that, that would be reason enough to look at establishing a corporation. As I say, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't think any of those situations applied to this case. This is a recreation center. It's not overly technical. Um, And, and I think, you know, recreation being one of the one of the core uh, aspects of a municipality, I think uh, citizens would appreciate open meetings. I think it's the kind of thing that that uh, fits under the board model much better than the corporation. So that was my recommendation to go with the uh, the board. Mr. McEachern, any questions with respect to the board versus corporation governance model that's being proposed? Mayor Robinson. Yeah, maybe just for clarification, I see and the authority of the board is to set public user fees. I'm not quite clear on how, with the YMCA operating and having membership, just how that fits into this board in terms of setting fees and, and how does this board interact with the Y? I think that the board would ultimately I mean, keeping in mind that we don't have an agreement with the Y yet. So, um, but uh, obviously that would be something to work through and, and whether, for example, the board gives the overall approval of the Y's recommendation as an example, um, I, I would see it sort of working that way. Where the Y brings forward a proposal and, and the board approves the fees. Okay, thank you. I, if, if the chair likes, I can go through the agreement. I just sort of paused on the first half there. Okay, I'll, I'll continue on. I'll just hit Please some do. highlights. Please do. Uh, 
so we established, we start off with some recitals here in the agreement and, um, you know, lay out different sections of the act that give the authorization for it. We talk about the, uh, the ability to, uh, to delegate the authority. Uh, this board is an agent of the municipalities. The decision to sign this agreement is a decision to authorize a, a fair bit of responsibility. Uh, we lay out uh, the, the reason for the board with the, uh, the investment under the Canada Infrastructure Program. We talk about the financially committed uh, partners, the member municipalities, and we, we introduce that concept. And then the, the First Nations um, who have not financially committed that they would be granted non-voting partner status, or participant status, sorry. Moving on to section one. Uh, this is where we establish the board for the purpose of acting as an agent for the seven municipalities uh, to construct and operate the, uh, the West Perry Sand Recreation and Cultural Center. And I'll just, again, I'll just kind of skip through and highlight some of the, some of the, the more uh, important terms, I think. Uh, 1A, this is where a municipality can appoint one member of council as a voting member. When there's a, there's that element of control here with the board that you might not have with a corporation. So it's a member of council is how we've got this set up at this time. Um, there's an alter, you know, one B allows for an alternative member uh, in the event the first member cannot make a meeting, uh, and that allows you the continuity and the ability to vote on an issue. One uh, C members on the board have no fixed term of appointment. In other words. Each of the seven municipalities can make their own decision. Do you want to appoint a member of your council for one year, two years, or all four years? That's up to each municipality. Uh, 1D, it's set up right now as members not receiving any uh, remuneration for their, uh, for their service. Um, as we get into budget that, you know, this may help with the budgeting later on. Uh, 1E, members have weighted votes. This was just based on the cost formula, um, obviously rounded up to a whole number there. And, and again, an F picking up from the recitals, the, uh, the two First Nations uh, who have not financially contributed are uh, invited to attend meetings and participate and give their input. Uh, but they are non-voting participants and would not ultimately vote on any of the decisions. 1L, uh, one of the first duties of the, the board is going to be uh, passing a procedural bylaw as required under the Act, uh, again, because it's a local board, as I touched on earlier. And so on that note, this agreement is meant to be a higher level, uh, you know, constitutional type document, if you will. A lot of the details will get filled in, uh, you know, in a procedural bylaw. Section two has got the uh, delegated authority and it's very broad. The board has full authority and necessary powers to manage the construction and operation of the center. That's, that's why we're setting it up. And we've listed a few items there just in an attempt to give them broad authority. Section six, they have the authority to uh, get some administrative help. However, they do that from the private sector, from one of the municipalities. Uh, again, that's, that's very broad, just a, intending to allow them to, uh, to function. Going on to section nine, uh, we've got the subheading there of annual budgets and a capital reserve fund. So the idea is that in the operation phase, once the facility is up and running, that the board is going to obtain their, they're going to set up, well, they'll be setting budgets each year and operating in a capital budget. And <coughs> section um, 11 talks about the need to get an asset management plan together within the first couple of years of getting this facility built. Hopefully there will not be too many capital costs the first few years. However, obviously as the years go by, the capital costs are gonna increase. And that's the idea of getting a reserve fund started early so that the payments, the requests from the seven municipalities are going to be a little more evened out over the each years rather than <coughs> an ugly surprise in, in year 10 or whenever. 
Paragraph 12, we've set it up so that the board has no authority to borrow funds. Um, another little sort of safety, if you will, uh, for the seven municipalities. Um, these budgets are gonna come to the seven municipalities each year for approval. And, and we just thought it was a better situation to have just the money budgeted being approved as opposed to the board after that budget gets that being able to go elsewhere for to borrow funds for some other cause. The exception in there, of course, is if in an emergency situation, they can borrow only from one of the seven municipalities. Uh, section 14 is the, you know, the, how the annual municipal payments will be uh, divvied up. That's part of that cost sharing formula that was discussed earlier. And this would be looked at at least every 10 years in case there are large swings in population, something that might change, have a need to change the formula. Section 17, dispute mechanism. Ultimately, the board has the authority to review and settle any disputes put forward by one or more of the municipalities. We did have a discussion about uh, whether there ought to be a way to appeal that. Uh, but my feelings on this is it's a democracy and once the, the decision uh, of the seven members having voted on something, if there's the ability for one municipality to uh, appeal that decision, you could get into a, a situation where the tail is wagging the dog um, if they're able to go elsewhere to, to get that decision overturned. So much like if a citizen appears before one of your councils, makes a request and, and the decision is no, um, provided proper procedure has been um, followed, uh, there's really no appeal, appealable method other than to ask for a reconsideration, but that's just sort of the nature of how a democracy works. That's how I envisioned this, this system working. Um, and paragraph 18, amendments to the agreement. We've got that set up that if there's two thirds vote of the municipalities, they can make a change, accepting the event that another municipality wants to join or a municipality wants to withdraw from the board. Uh, which obviously would make things more expensive for everyone else left. Uh, so that's a pretty serious decision and that would require a 100% vote. That's my uh, quick overview on the agreement, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Questions? Is there anything that um, any member of the selection committee would like to uh, bring to our attention with respect to the proposed uh, governance recommendation? Uh, Mr. Harris, if you could please unmute, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that was a pretty pretty good overview of the, of the highlights. Just maybe one point when it's, um, and Mr. McEachern and I just clarified this today, when you're voting on the board, there's a weighted vote based on if you're paying more, you, you got more votes. When, when the two thirds vote is required, uh, if you wanted to change the agreement, that's just uh, each municipality gets one vote. And if two thirds of the municipalities vote for changing the agreement, then the changes that's not a weighted vote in that case, just to clarify that. Thank you for the clarification. Other questions or no comments? Thank you very much, Mr. McKechnie. Thank you. We will move on next to the uh, discussion around facility operations. Mr. Harris. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's in the report, but I think it's been generally assumed that we would look to uh, entering into an operating agreement with the YMCA. Um, the other alternative would be any one municipality or set up an entirely new uh, staff structure. I don't think any one of those options makes sense. The Y currently has a presence in the community 
they've got expertise, uh, which is required to run a pool and the other types of programming. And they have the ability to draw on not only expertise in, in the facility in the municipality they're operating, but there's a head office that they can draw expertise from or other, other facilities that they operate throughout Ontario. So we think it makes uh, a lot of sense to work to develop an operating agreement with the YMCA to operate this facility. Thank you. How do members feel about that? Councillor Gilbert and then Mayor McDermott. We're in agreement with that. Uh, I've talked to all my council about that and we're in agreement that the Y should run it. Thank you. Mayor McDermott. Um, I'm in agreement with it at this point in time, uh, but I do think there should be a clause somewhere that it gets the management of the facility gets reviewed. I don't know whether it's every three years or five years so that there is an opportunity to revisit um, at some point. I don't think it should be an in perpetuity agreement. Thank you. Reeve Liverance, yes. Go ahead, please. We know what other municipalities that have Y facilities in their area are using for their evaluation criteria. Uh, through the chair, we haven't uh, we haven't got that uh, that far down the process. One of the things that's on the recommendation list today is that we start to uh, negotiate that operating agreement with the Y. Um, We've got connections in municipalities in which uh, they currently operate facilities. So getting access to current agreements, uh, understanding how they make those evaluations, how often the agreement comes up for review, that I think that'll all be readily available, that information. Uh, have and, any, yeah, sorry. Uh, have any municipalities declined to have the Y continue to operate their facilities? Not, not that, certainly not that we've heard of. I mean, it's, it's possible, but not that we've heard of, not that we're aware of. Okay, thank you. And just if I could just make a comment, Mr. Chairman, um, the why from the beginning of this process, you know, a, a year and a half, 18 months ago, the why has been there to provide whatever support. You want information on what it costs to operate our Gravenhurst facility, which is comparable size to the one we're proposing here. They've given us their staff, they've given us the information, they've given us all the resources all the way along through this. They've worked with the architects on the capital costs, the layout, like what's, you can lay out a, a facility that is very awkward for customers and members to use or one that makes it flow. So they've been really helpful through all the processes. So uh, that's another reason why we, we don't anticipate an issue that they, very good working relationship. Sorry, Councillor Gilbert. Just, um, just with one, we went to look at it, the, uh, the Wasega Beach site, which was run by the Y, just as part of a site uh, viewing. And they thought at the time um, that they would lose about $100,000 a year. And I guess the first year, the, the municipality had to come up with the 100000 And then since that time, I think it's uh, eight or nine years old now, the municipality is not had to pay anything so they've run it and they've done a, a great job and and brought that number down to a zero so that you know there's no cost to the taxpayer above um uh, membership fees and the other thing i think that uh, maybe mr harris can um verify this but they uh before said that we put the building up and they own the equipment so we don't have to like once we put the building up start buying exercise equipment and the Y supplies that as part of the lease agreement, I guess. Uh, through the chair, I'm not aware of that. That's why I can't comment either way, but it's uh, certainly if, uh, if they're going to provide the equipment, I'm sure that their management fees are going to be higher. I, I think one way or another, uh, we're going to be, 
the people that use the facility that own the facility are going to pay for it. But it still might be the way we want to go. I think that'll come up very quickly in negotiations. And uh, it's interesting to hear that, though. Appreciate it. Reeve Liverance? Yeah, this is more of a comment than a question. I think that it's pretty clear to everybody that once a facility like this comes into our area, that it's going to be a feature that attracts more residents to our geography. And so to, to uh, Councillor Gilbert's point, with Sega Beach, once they had the facility, that more members came in uh, because it's, it's an attraction to the area. Thank you for that. I'm Mayor McGarvey. I actually heard that uh, about a week and a half ago from uh, a Whitestone resident that uh, is working here in the area and said that they would gladly pay $100 more in their taxes a year to have a facility like that, even though they may not use it, but it's going to attract professionals and all those other people to the area that we've been looking for and trying to get. And this is, is going to, you know, certainly provide that uh, advantage to us. So it's, uh, they're looking forward to it, really looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you. Other comments, questions? And the last uh, item for discussion before we move into recommendations is uh, around next steps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, the committee hasn't voted yet and uh, yet to see what those recommendations are, but the, the plan, if you like, is in a perfect world, if the recommendations that is put forward were exactly what the committee's endorsed, the next step would be to go to each of the area municipalities, each to each council and get them to endorse the working committee's recommendations. Uh, we're here to ask you to endorse the steering committee's recommendations, which certainly you have uh, you know, the right to amend or, or change anything. Uh, but once they're your recommendations and those recommendations need to be presented to each of the local councils and endorsed, and what we're recommending, uh, the process that makes sense to us was that it's the chair of your committee, which is Mr. Sanderson, uh, with the support of the architects, the engineers, or any other resources that he felt necessary, and to then schedule a series of uh, municipal visits to get the municipal endorsement, endorsement and also to uh, attend and present where we are to date to the First Nation communities uh, more as an information sharing to keep them in the loop and understanding what's what's taking place. Thank you. Comments? Mayor Ann. Mayor McDermott, yes, please. Just one thing that I would like to add that I think is timely to the recommendations, and we've been kind of sitting on our hands through this, but I really believe that it is time to start a fundraising committee or a fundraising effort, both at a corporate level and at a community level. Um, and I believe that there may be some fairly significant corporate dollars now that we've got a picture of the facility now that we've got some card costs and um i i do believe uh, as it was stated earlier that this whole thing proceeding is dependent on the icip um, application being approved but i also believe that there's an opportunity to build um some significant fundraising dollars, but also some community, um, what do I call it, support and energy by initiating something public. So in addition to the resolutions that are on the table, I, I would like to see a resolution that talks about a fundraising initiative. And I'm prepared to be involved at a corporate level. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor McGarvey. I would certainly support uh, Mayor McDermott's um, quest for, for that. I think it's a great idea. Mr. Harris? 
um, through the chair, um, certainly that's uh, that's a great idea because the more we get the community involved, um, you know, the more successful it will be. It, it creates awareness and, and creates uh, some uh, money opportunities. In the um, decision-making model that each council has already approved, there is a provision for a, a future sponsorship committee. So Mayor McDermott's exactly right. Um, and there's a lot of work to get done, even to get those that infrastructure, if you like, in place. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure the committee's thought of it, but just a caution, not going public until we get the funding, uh, because if we don't get the funding, you know, the plans may change significantly, but there's a lot of preparatory work that could be done. Thank you. Councillor Gilbert. Um, just with the recommendation of the, um, the design and construction, um, I think I'm going to have a hard time going back to my council to say, you know, we voted on this one or that one until we know if we have the funding and then like um, with the Mayor McDermott's suggestion there of uh, commercial and uh, and personal funding coming forward, that we might jump up into the next um, six lanes if all of a sudden now it looks like we have you know more funding coming from other parts and we want to uh, jump up and um, and I guess my other question is on that uh, constructing, are we going to um, when we get the funding, I guess, go to an RFP or a tender to do the facility? Yes. Mr. Harris, uh, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> perhaps I could respond. The uh, partnership agreement that Mr. Uh, McEachern took us through uh, speaks to that responsibility, the construction and everything that follows after that is the responsibility of that committee. It's, it's a big responsibility, but it's it's their decision as to how how we move this project forward, what gets tendered, uh, you know, a design build, turnkey, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, it would be that new, uh, that new board, that joint municipal board would be their decision to make. And then back to my thought of the, uh, you know, A or B, then should we defer that until we talk to our councils and say, you know, what if, so we have a better understanding of what everybody's thinking? My, uh, my opinion, we haven't really talked about this at the steering committee, but I would think um, we need to, uh, we need to be ready to respond if we get the approvals. Um, if we get the approvals, we've only got, uh, what we've asked for is 32 million. Um, we would have a bit of time, between, and there's deadlines as to when this project has to be tendered, designed, built, and uh, open for occupancy to meet the federal uh, and provincial guidelines. So I think we could get it, get, if we get the 73% funding, get all the municipalities behind it, uh, there might be a window of opportunity if we think we can get some big donors, whether it's naming the facility or whatever, that are because everything out over the 32 million is 100% municipal dollars. So I wouldn't want to tender the project, design it and tender it on a maybe we'll get the money. Uh, I'd want a greater sense that there were some big dollars in play and uh, the Burt Liverance Community Center, perhaps. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> if there were some bigger dollars in play, that, then you might design something bigger than what we've got money approved from the federal provincial government. But I, I think that's to hold off the entire project until we see how that's going to uh, fan out. We don't know if, if, assuming that the committee this evening was happy with all the recommendations, I think there's still some selling that needs to be done to each of the local councils. So. I, I hate to defer that because we might get some money through donations to build a bigger facility. I mean, that's starts to stretch it out. Uh. Thank you. Um, one final comment, Councillor Gilbert. But uh, all I'm saying is if, if we defer it, then you can go back to your council and say, well, here's a option and here's B option, two different numbers. 
I think if we pass it, pass one tonight, and then you go back to council and say, here's what we did. And then, you know, like you're changing it again after the fact, aren't we? Like if we agree that we're going to do one of those proposals, like I'm in agreement that both of those are great things. How much money do we have? That's my question. We have uh, uh, Mayor McDermott and then Mayor McGarvey, please. Um, I guess from a fundraising point of view, I'm not suggesting that we go door knocking tomorrow and ask for money. There's a lot of there's a lot of infrastructure work that needs to be done by a fundraising company or organization. Uh, what is the naming rights worth? Is it 10 million? Is it 20 million? What if you name uh, the gym? There's a lot of work that needs to be done before you door knock. And I'm just suggesting we better get started at that. I'm not suggesting that we um, go big for the corporate dollars until we know what proportion of ICIP funding is there. But it is there's there's formulas to be set up and that kind of thing. And I, I think we can easily start that work kind of in confidence now. But if we could get a naming, if we could get a naming corporation at 10 or 5 million, it would make a heck of a lot of difference between four and six lanes. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor McGarvey. Yeah, I I, I don't see us jumping into option B, like with the whole um, uh, enchilada, as they say. Uh, so I, I think if, if we were going to do something with six lanes and, you know, Mayor McDermott has, you know, she's, she's relayed some ideas as to why, you could do a hybrid of, of option A and just basically push the wall out, the building out a little bit further and add another two lanes instead of going for all of the extra features that option B has. Because I think we need to be reasonably frugal on, on uh, the majority of the building. So really A provides us with everything that we need. And so you end up with an A hybrid that gives you possibly, if we can get the, fund, the fundraising that's needed, uh to to help with that extra cost to add the other two lanes i i don't you know it could be a with you know an addition to it i i think b is just too much because we're it, it, it's just just a lot anyway that's just my opinion and i, th I think people will have an opportunity to uh to um, to vote on that in a in a few moments. Other questions or comments around next steps before we um, consider the recommendations on an individual basis. And a lot of material covered. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Mayor Comrie. Yes, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I I just wanted to comment. I I, I think that there is a need um, to have some some more community consultation than we have at the, at the municipal level, at least certainly in our municipality in terms of, of um, sort of getting people on board what this is about and, and what it's gonna cost and what the benefits are and so on. Um, we haven't, unfortunately, we, we haven't had the opportunity to have that sort of discussion that I think we thought we would. Um, for two reasons. One is that it wasn't clear whether whether we were really in line for fun, for government funding or not. <laughs> and secondly, COVID-19, uh, you know, has prevented us from doing some of the things that we might otherwise have done. So, so I'm sort of looking forward to say, well, how do we get as a municipality get to the point where we have to, where we're ready to make a council decision to, to support this and um, I, I think it's, it's very important that we do have an opportunity for the material that's been presented tonight to be presented to our, all of our council and our ratepayers, and then to have some discussion and, and, and an opportunity for, for people in the community to provide feedback and so on so that we can, uh, um, you know, we, we can 
um, make make an informed decision as a council. So I, I, I and I'm assuming that the plan is that we should we should try to go ahead with this even as we're waiting for approval of or, or for for notification that we have funding. Right. So. Uh, Maybe somebody can clarify that for me, but I'm not. You're not. You're not suggesting that we wait till we get till we get on notice of uh, that the, the, the funding's been approved before we before we roll out the roadshow. Is that? Am I right on that? Uh, you are correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. Um, Mr. Spagnuolo. Sorry, through the chair. Um, I just wanted to comment. Uh, this design is a conceptual design for program only. There's still opportunities in the future once the next stage of this project moves forward that modifications happen. We've, I've been on a number of projects where a donor comes around and has five, six million dollars that he wants to donate to a project. And we've added a whole theater based on a project at that point. So there are opportunities still I think what uh, this council should be uh, looking at is the program as it stands now and the opportunities may open up to baking it to the next option B or a modified option A and B uh, and in the next stage of this uh, project. There are a number of opportunities still to, to nothing set in stone with this. It's just a program right now that I think the council's approving. So I just wanted to make it clear, the building is not completely designed. It's just a conceptual schematic design to put a program uh, in for the, the purpose of uh, getting a budget and getting a idea of what can fit on the sites. Thank you, that's important and helpful. Yeah. Councillor Gilbert. Just a comment before we talk about the uh, the recommendations. Um, it's always been sort of my thought and, and hope, I guess, when we heard about the new school coming and then the possibility of a pool in a perfect world, they would have been side by side. And I guess that's why, you know, I've sort of stuck with the idea of the, the larger property all the time. And it uh, sounds like the school is kind of stuck in their, uh, in the, in their spot there. So, um, just wanted to put that comment out there in a perfect world you know when you're building community all of those things would end up being on the same street or the same property or whatever but it doesn't sound like it's going to happen here through, through the chair yes sir uh the rfp came out for the school this week uh there's a site visit tomorrow for the school so um, they are pretty set that it's going to be built in the exact same spot. And, and I agree, we've done projects where a number of projects where there are school and rec centers together. Bracebridge is a perfect example of it. We did another one out in uh, Alberta in Shaughnessy, and we had a library, an arena complex, uh, the Y rec center, and a high school together. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, before we um, move into the recommendations, so we they, they are before you, is there any discussion that you would like to uh, entertain uh, before I ask for a, a mover and a seconder for our first um, recommendation? All right, um, Mr. So, Chairman. Yes, can, Mr. Can Mayor. We have, can we have recorded votes on the recommendations? Yes, it would. Sorry, it would be my my intention, and I, I believe the purview as the as the chair is to ask for a recorded uh, vote on each of the recommendations as they're presented. And um, Madam Clerk is going to help us with that. And um, I was just wondering about whether there's uh, so 
any desire to go into closed session for any of these uh, matters? No, I'm seeing none. Seeing none. Okay, that's good. Thank you. So let's um, move into the first recommendation that is uh, before us. And it is that the uh, report by CSNP Architects and their site recommendation for the existing YMCA site located at 36 Smith Crescent be approved. To get that on the table, may I have a mover and a seconder? We have a mover by Mayor Robinson and seconded by Reeve Liverance. And we are open for discussion. Hearing none, are we ready for the question? All in favor? We're, we're doing recorded votes. So Thank you. Need, yes. Ms. Johnson. Um, Thank you. I will ask, I will say the name of um, members in, in order and please just answer yes or no. In response to the question on the table, Reeve Bert Liverance. Yes. Uh, Councillor Terry Gilbert. You're muted. Councillor Terry, Terry Gilbert, you're muted. Uh, no. Mayor Dale Robinson. Yes. Councillor Morley Hascom. Yes. Mayor Jamie McGarvey. Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott. Yes. Mayor George Comrie. Yes. The uh, the resolution passes uh, six to one. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. The second mec uh, recommendation reads that the um, Wellness Center Pool Committee recommends that option, I believe it is option A, in the architect's presentation be approved for the purposes of designing and constructing the facility. May I have a mover? Mayor McGarvey and a seconder. Mayor Robinson and that motion is open for discussion. Mayor McDermott. Just following up on Mr. Spagnolo's comment that we're really only approving option A for the conceptual design at this stage, are we not? So it money falls out of the sky, it could be modified. I, that's, I'm wondering correct. We, that's correct as the, the motion reads approval for the purposes of design and constructing the facility. Could we change it to for purposes of conceptual design of the facility at this point in time? Mr. Chair, I, I believe we have the conceptual design, if I understand Mr. If I understand Sam correctly. And we need to go to the, I guess the real design. And we've got time to change it as that design is happening. Is and that that's all I'm trying to say is that, that there would be an opportunity if we had more money or we had new information that we could modify it. I don't want to say that we're going to land on constructing option A yet. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Members feel that, that sorry, Mr. Spagnuolo. Can you say budgeting for construction rather than construction? Because that's making it more definite, that defined. I'm comfortable with that. Are movers and um, seconders comfortable with that? Councillor Gilbert. Is, it, is there an opportunity as well to, to um, maybe Mr. Spagnola knows the closest um, building to that design that we could go do a site uh, visit, I guess. So if we did a site visit and we said, you know, everybody likes what we saw after the fact, or everybody would like to see 
you know, a little bit more of that. I know um, I've seen a couple and um, I don't want to get to the point where you, you're, you're sort of marketing um, like the seniors or the small children. You're, you're trying to build a facility that kind of markets everybody. And it'd be nice to walk into a building that uh, is close to this type A Yes, Mr. Spagnuolo. Through your, the chair, um, what we understand is this uh, model is similar to the Innisville Y, um, I believe. And but we can get you some uh, comparable Y properties that you can walk through. Um, we'll work with uh, Ryan and Rob Johnson from the Y to list a couple uh, facilities that are of similar sizes and uh, that you can look at. Thank you, Mr. Councillor Gilbert, and then Mayor Robinson. Well, just um, like I said, I, I mentioned the Wasega Beach one, mm -hmm. and uh, we we actually went down, a couple of us, to look at that one as part of a, uh, a site visit to say, you know, what are we looking for? And it looked great for the exercise program and lane swimming, but it didn't look that great for um, like kids playing or like a water polo event, you know, like different aquatic uh, things going on. So you just, we only get one chance at this. And I guess it'd be nice, like I said, to just walk into a building in, in his, in his fill's not that far. We can certainly yeah. make that happen. Thank you. So, uh, Mayor Robinson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, addition of, budgeting for is a friendly amendment to that resolution. So I'd be in favor of adding that to the resolution. We do have the resolution on the table in front of us. As McDougall's rep, I'll speak to that. Uh, I'll be in favor of option A uh, because we've had some input. It's been upgraded from the original option A. Thank you very much to the citizens group. I know no one there will be completely happy in terms of getting everything. But I remember from early marketing courses that when you go to buy a watch, we all want to buy a Rolex but we end up with the Timex because that's what we can afford and it's still very functional and serves the purposes. Uh, and the other thing on this we have to remember too is operational costs. And if we start adding things, we start adding and operational costs are there forever and a day. They don't go away. So we always have to bear that in mind as well. So I, I will be as McDougall's rep voting in favor of option A with the friendly amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Robinson. So, um, Ms. Johnson, could you just read the uh, the um, um, recommendation with the friendly amendment, and then we'll do the recorded vote. That the Wellness Centre Pool Committee recommends that option A in the architect's presentation be approved for the purposes of budgeting for construction of the facility. I believe this is purposes of design and budgeting for the construction of the facility. Was that correct? I understood it that it was just uh, budgeting, but I think uh, design and budgeting is uh, fair as well. Thank you. All right, could you please proceed with the recorded vote? Yes, in a different order this time, and I'll be taking the resolutions in a different uh, order. Um, I, what I mean is the uh, asking members uh, in different order. Um, so I will say your name and please just answer yes or no. Uh, Mayor George Comrie. Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott. Yes. Mayor Jamie McGarvey. Yes. Councillor Morley Hascom. Yes. Mayor Dale Robinson. Yes. Councillor Terry Gilbert. Yes. And Reed Burt Liverance. Yes. The motion carries unanimously seven to zero. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And recommendation number three reads that the steering committee recommend with respect to cost sharing be approved as follows. And the table is um, reads um, Township of the Archipelago at 11.4%, Township of Carling at 9.2%, the Township of McDougall at 16.2%, Sorry, that's the municipality of McDougal, the uh, township of McKellar at 9.3%, the town of Perry Sound at 25.3%, the township of Seguin at 22.5%, and the municipality of Whitestone at 6.1% for a total of 100%. May I have a mover and a seconder to get that on the table for discussion, please, 
Uh, Councillor Gilbert is moving and Councillor McDermott is seconding and we are open for discussion. I do understand that there has been considerable work done by the uh, steering committee and appreciate that. Are we ready for a recorded vote? Ms. Johnson, would you please proceed with a recorded vote? Yes, please just answer yes or no, uh, yes or no to the question uh, when your name is called. Councillor Terry Gilbert? Yes. Mayor Dale Robinson? Yes. Councillor Morley Haskam? Yes. Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. Mayor George Comrie? Mayor George Comrie? Yes. Reeve Burt Liverance? Yes. Carried unanimously. Recommendation number four reads that a joint municipal service board be established by the seven area municipalities for the purpose of acting as an agent on behalf of the municipalities in the construction, maintenance, and operation of the West Perry Sound Area Recreation and Cultural Center. I have a mover and a seconder to get this on the table for discussion. Reeve Leverance and Mayor McGarvey are open for discussion. Mr. Chair, if I could uh, interject. Yes, please, uh, Mr. Harris. Um, we might want to include design in there. Um, I, I think that the design of the facility just before construction. Would um, our uh, people comfortable, the uh, mover and seconder comfortable with that as a friendly amendment? It would read in the design, construction, maintenance, and operation of the West Perry Sound Area Recreation and Culture Center. Seeing nods. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Johnson, would you take us through a recorded vote, please? Yes, again, answering yes or no when your name is called. Um, Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Councillor Morley Haskam? Yes. Mayor Dale Robinson? Yes. Councillor Terry Gilbert? Yes. Reeve Burt Liverance? Yes. And Mayor George Comrie? Yes. Carried unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Recommendation number five, that the Joint Municipal Service Board Agreement be approved substantially in the form hereto attached. May I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Mayor McDermott and uh, Mayor Comrie. And the recommendation is on the table for discussion. I believe we're ready for a recorded vote, Ms. Johnson. Yes, again, answering yes or no when your name is called. Uh, Mayor Dale Robinson? Yes. Councillor Morley Haskam? Yes. Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. Mayor George Comrie? Yes. Reeve Burt Liverance? Yes. Councillor Terry Gilbert? Yes. Carried unanimously. Ms. Johnson. Recommendation number six, that the chair of the West, or sorry, of the Wellness Center Pool Committee uh, be authorized to, to present the Wellness Center Pool Committee recommendations to each funding partner for their endorsement and to the two First Nation partners with whatever support the chairman deems appropriate, including the support of cs and Architects and Tatham Engineering. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Reeve Liverance and uh, Mayor Robinson. And that recommendation is on the table for discussion. Yes, Councillor Gilbert. 
Fair enough. Just sure if I understood the last part of that with CC Tatum and the architects, is that just for questions and things? Is that what you're doing? To yeah, to uh, to be able to answer specific questions. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Mayor Robinson. This is a way of comment. I would hope. I mean, you've really signed up for a onerous task here to be going out and visiting all these councils and, and doing this. So it's good to see the support. But I think a lot of the onus for that, when you come to make your presentation, falls back on this committee and the steering committee as well. We've been here through it all, so we should understand it. No reason why we wouldn't. So it's up to us as well to be there to support you when you show up at our councils. So I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> that motion passes. I would certainly appreciate it and, and hope to have that support. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Johnson, would you please take us through a recorded vote? Yes. Uh, once again, answering yes or no when your name is called. Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Councillor Morley Hascom? Yes. Mayor Dale Robinson? Yes. Councillor Terry Gilbert? Yes. Reeve Burt Liverance? Yes. Mayor George Comrie? Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. Carried unanimously. Mr. Johnson. Recommendation number seven rec or reads that the steering committee be directed to enter into negotiations to secure the approved site. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Mayor McGarvey and seconded by Mayor McDermott. And that recommendation is on the table for discussion. Ms. Johnson, would you please take us through a recorded vote? And answering yes or no when your name is called. Councillor Morley Hascom? Yes. Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. Mayor George Comrie? Yes. Reed Burt Liverance? Yes. Councillor Terry Gilbert? Yes. Mayor Dell Robinson? Yes. Carried unanimously. Ms. Johnson. And uh, recommendation number eight, that the steering committee be directed to enter into negotiations with the YMCA for the purposes of managing and operating the facility. May I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Reeve Liverance and seconded by Councillor Gilbert. And that recommendation is on the table for discussion. Ms. Johnson, would you please take a recorded vote? Again, answering yes or no when your name is called. Mayor Dale Robinson? Yes. Councillor Terry Gilbert? Yes. Reed Burt Liverance? Yes. Mayor George Comrie? Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Councillor Morley Hascom? Yes. Passed unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. And the ninth and final recommendation reads that pending approval of the ICIP grant application, that the steering committee be directed to take the necessary steps to create the Joint Municipal Service Board. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Gilbert and Mayor McGarvey. And that recommendation is on the table for discussion. Ms. Johnson, will you take us through a final recorded vote, please? Yes, answering yes or no when your name is called. Uh, Mayor Jamie McGarvey? Yes. Mayor Ann McDermott? Yes. Mayor George Comrie? Yes. Reeve Burt Liverance? Yes. Councillor Terry Gilbert? 
Yes. Mayor Dale Robinson? Yes. Councilor Morley Haskin? Yes. Passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Before I declare the meeting adjourned, are there any final comments that, uh, yes, Mayor McDermott and then Ms. Mayor McGarvey? Do we need a motion or a resolution to strike a fundraising committee? Or can that just happen with the CAO committee? It's a question. Does the steering committee have a, an opinion on that matter? Uh, yes, I think uh, we, we could certainly start doing some of the legwork uh, at the steering committee level. Um, it's currently not part of the mandate of this committee, the, the working, uh, the wellness center and pool committee. It hasn't been assigned to, uh, to any committee at this point. What we could. So, sorry, um, Marianne, you're muted. Sorry. I, I, I'm comfortable with that as long as we start doing some of the, the, the groundwork that needs to happen. Um, I can give you some templates on capital campaigns and that kind of thing that needs to, to happen. And then maybe you bring it back to this committee. Mm. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Mayor McGarvey. Oh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say thank you to you for leading us through this meeting and all the work that uh, you've done on it. I really want to thank the uh, CAOs for all of their efforts that they've put into it, along with the architects and the engineers. Um, thank you. I mean, th there has been a lot of work that has gone into putting this all together, the grant application and, and, and this work that uh, has been done for tonight with regard to setting this whole process up. Uh, big thank you. I, I, it's, you know, um, a, a sort of a accumulation of all the efforts that have been done. And I know that, you know, you're going to have more work to do, Mr. Chair, as you know, this, this proceeds to go to all the councils. And I want to thank you for your commitment uh, to this. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you for those comments. It is a team sport. This is um, tremendous work on all of your behalfs and your teams as well, and compromise, difficult discussions. So um, it, it is our time and, um, and there's lots of heavy work to, to continue, but uh, we will be successful and this is a very exciting. So with that, I am going to call our meeting to uh, close and adjourn. Thank you very much for your time. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody take care.